The number of things, the number of, of parameters that describe, uh, for example, the production rate of photons, uh, the, uh, their escape into intergalactic medium, and, and uh, star formation efficiencies. And so there are three parameters in any uh, realization model that do not depend on your ability to treat the, uh, the, the, the process, in, the physical process in detail. So even the, the, in the best numerical simulation that you can, uh, uh, you can devise, there are still uncertainties related to parameters that, that uh, are uncertain and uh, cannot be derived from first principle. So uh, we uh, uh, highlight that we realize that it's very important to, in order to fix those parameters, to have a, a close contact with uh, any experiment that could be related to reionization. And so yesterday we ended by, uh, by using or, or trying to make uh, the, the first step in that direction by using the cosmic microwave background. And so what we uh, highlighted is the fact that there are at least three ways in which the, uh, which the CMB can, uh, can be affected by the way in which ionization occurs. And so we have seen uh, the first two options that are the damping of primary anisotropies of the CMB on all scales. This is a very difficult, uh, that uh, the, the, the effect is small, so uh, the, the differences in different ionization models are absorbed within the size of the error bars of the CMB measurement, so it's not very useful, can only provide some broad uh, upper limit. Uh, then we we'll look at very interesting possibility that, it, that it's uh, just being uh, started to, to, uh, to be investigated, uh, that is the production of uh, small scale secondary anisotropy. So while well, the primary spectrum of the CMB uh, goes down due to silk damping, the secondary anisotropy appears as a as a result of a modulation of the ionization uh, field with the velocity field and the CMB. And uh, today, uh, just like before we go into the, we dive into the 21 centimeter physics, uh, I'd like to uh, discuss a, a few more points on, 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 the, on the CMB and in particular on the large scale signal. Remember that we have defined this electron scattering optical depth. This is something that we covered yesterday, so I don't need to uh, go through again. But remember that this is the integrated uh, integrated effect of uh, free electrons on this layer of free electrons that through which the CMB photons had to pass before uh, uh, coming to us and there are Thomson interaction that, that change the uh, essentially the uh, spatial and angular properties of the CMB that we observe. So this is essentially the, the, the effect of realization of the CMB are somewhat proportional to the amplitude of this, of this value. So this is a very important number, and uh, this is something that can be, in fact, uh, derived from, from CMB observation. Uh, we, have, uh, we have been lucky that in the last few years we had two uh, fantastic experiments like uh, WMAP and Planck that have been observing uh, the, uh, the CMB to, with, with exquisite precision. And in particular, they have been able to also to, to obtain uh, polarization maps because, <coughs> as we'll see in a second, uh, the realization affects the uh, polarization spectrum of the, of the CMB. So these are maps of different frequencies, uh, and uh, these are the, uh, these are the uh, clean map after uh, we remove all artifacts, the galaxies and foregrounds and so on and so forth. And so these are the clean map. And, uh, uh, basically, this is the power spectrum that we can get. Uh, this is the standard uh, CMB uh, temperature power spectrum, but this is the, the polarization power spectrum, and this is the cross power spectrum between polar E mode and, uh, and T mode of the, of the power spectrum. So as you see immediately, uh, the, uh, the effect of reionization is to uh, move from the black curve to the, to the red curve here. Uh, and the data um, that are being measured, uh, these are WMAP data, by the way, uh, 
allow us to set a, to set a constraint on, on tau. So because from the amplitude of this deviation, it's possible to derive what is the uh, value of the, uh, of the electron scattering optical depth. And uh, for WMAP, uh, the, the value that was obtained, uh, or the, the Planck and WMAP, first release of Planck and com combined with WMAP, was given this value which is about 9%, uh, which corresponds in, in, in the uh, instantaneous realization model that we discussed yesterday is often used uh, as a first guide uh, by CMB people that if you want to, if you want to uh, transform this uh, tau e into a realization redshift by using the, the previous uh, relation that we have here, okay? So you have tau, so you can get a realization redshift if, uh, if you assume that, for example, uh, you prescribe that the realization uh, evolution is a step function, then you get something that it's um, uh, of the order of uh, realization would have occurred at redshift 10, okay? So let me, yeah, 10.8 plus or minus three, roughly. So uh, with now with Planck, we have improved uh, this, this data uh, considerably. We have increased the, the precision. So this is a measurement of the EE uh, power spectrum by Planck. Uh, unfortunately, they don't go yet to the, uh, to the very low L mode, which are the most affected by realization. So we are still using here, we are combining this data at the moment with the uh, WMAP data at low L, but of course the errors here uh, that are so small that can help us improve uh, that limit. And in fact, that value has changed now. So this is the latest uh, value that we have available uh, from the uh, latest Planck analysis uh, published this year. So uh, this is uh, one month ago or maybe two months ago. Uh, so tau, it's now of the order of 6.6 percent plus or minus uh, 1 percent, 1.6 percent. So uh, you see that the, the error are, are decreasing, but also the value of tau has been decreasing since, you know, uh, in the last 10 years. So each uh, um, measurement uh, has been contributing to decrease the value of tau, and that means that br it's bringing realization closer to us, so to a lower redshift. In fact, now the redshift range is still uh, certainly above six, but now is constrained to be between 7.2 and 10.5. I reiterate that this is a redshift that you should take with some uh, grain of salt because this clearly it's, it's based on the assumption that realization is a step function. When you do something a little bit more complicated, you see that uh, it's possible to have different, different values. But nevertheless, the fact that tau is it's certainly decreasing depends on a better treatment of uh, foreground, essentially, um, the, the tau measurement is affected by the presence of dust in the, in the galaxy that is uh, producing noise and, and, and the foreground that you need to be able to um, subtract carefully and Planck has done a very good job on that. And so we think that we are now uh, more or less stabilizing around, around this value of, of tau. So um, if, uh, in this case, uh, I was saying that, that in addition to the CMB, though, uh, we have a number of other uh, experimental constraints that we can use in order to build models that are uh, fully consistent with data. Because, uh, as I said before, there are many free parameters that, that we cannot control. And uh, so we need data to, to constrain things that we don't know. And uh, among these, there are things that, that should uh, obviously sound familiar to you after these three lectures. So the first is the, is the Gump peterson tau that we have uh, discussed in, in detail. And together with the Lyman Alpha, that you can also do uh, uh, devise the same, uh, same type of uh, quantity, like the Gump peterson opacity for the Lyman beta transition. The electron scattering optical that we have just discussed. Uh, the UV background intensity, uh, I, I touched upon that on, in the first lecture, so this is, a, this is another constraint that, that is given. Um, and then there is the uh, redshift evolution of Lyman limit system. So what are Lyman limit system? Remember when I show you the, the simulation of the, of the realization, there were these uh, islands of, uh, of neutral gas, which are something between the intergalactic medium and the galaxy itself. So they are moderately uh, over 
super dense regions that uh, retain some, uh, some neutral hydrogen uh, sufficient to absorb considerably uh, the, the UV photons. And so uh, from their number, as the, the number evolves with, with time, uh, we can also have constraints from, on the, on the um, ionization history. Uh, the temperature of the intergalactic medium I've uh, discussed, uh, then there are other that are probably less, uh, less important. But uh, just to give you an idea that, that there are many constraints that the organization is, tight, is, is very um, is tightly linked with, with the number of processes that has to do, uh, of course, that, that, that has to do with um, galaxy formation and, uh, and the intergalactic medium evolution. So, so now, uh, what can we do? Uh, one approach is just to run simulation, but these simulations are very expensive, and uh, you cannot vary uh, your parameters in a, in a completely uh, in the, in, um, to explore the parameter space as thoroughly as you would like to. So uh, another approach is just a little bit like uh, uh, in the spirit of, of CMB uh, physics in which we, we measure a power spectrum and then we have a cosmological parameter with many free parameters like omega m, omega b, all the cosmological parameters. And so what we do, just we, uh, we do um, uh, some type of uh, statistical uh, or analysis based on, for example, on, on Monte Carlo Markov chain, just to adjust the, the parameters to their best fit to the to the data. So you can take the same approach uh, for uh, for reionization, just having uh, a, a relatively simple but uh, physically motivated model. And then you can try to, uh, to do the same type of analysis uh, and in order to fit all the, the available data that you can find uh, in the literature. So this is, a, this is a, a, an example of such an approach in which you have uh, uh, a, a semi-analytical but physically complete model that, you, that depends on, on uh, parameters that, that we don't know as the, the ones that we mentioned already, and by doing a principal component analysis or a Monte Carlo Marco chain uh, a type of, uh, of study, we can uh, derive uh, the, uh, the possible realization history. So you are not finding uh, a single realization uh, history that fits all the data, but you find uh, fiducial models uh, and uh, you give some uh, idea of the confidence level that that model has with respect to the data. So these are uh, six uh, predictions, for example, for uh, of one of these models that are tuned to, to, to fit the data of different types. So what do we have here? The first is the, uh, the famous parameter that the uh, that the, is the, the number of ionizing photon per baryon that you put in stars that go into the IGM. Uh, the second here, this is the photoionization rate. Remember, we defined the photoionization rate as a function of redshift, and so uh, these are the data points that are measured up to redshift six. So you have a model that fits that, and that this is the prediction. Or this is the number of uh, Lyman limit systems, the, the one that I just uh, described, so the number of uh, uh, neutral islands that are left over by ionization as a function of redshift, so you, you predict this. And this is the uh, feeling factor that, that we have uh, also defined uh, yesterday. So this is how uh, the feeling factor grows as a, function, as a function of time. There is a spread, of course. You see that you can get models that uh, uh, essentially complete ionization between 6 uh, and 10, so which, which are uh, certainly um, within the, the, even the, the latest WMAP uh, determination. And so this is the, uh, probably the key, the key function, there is the evolution of the neutral hydrogen uh, fraction, so the universe starts uh, neutral and then the neutral hydrogen fraction drops uh, almost uh, precipitously uh, down to very low values that we, where we measure actually 4, 5, and 6. Uh, so these are the gum peterson limits, and also we have the, we can exploit not only the, the CMB data, not only in the, uh, for what concerns tau, which is a single number, but there is more information that can extract from the CMB that has to do with the full power spectra that you have. So you have many data points here, so uh, 
maybe it does not make sense to fit only one number, which is tau, uh, uh, when you have all this wealth of, of data. So if you fit all these, these uh, models together, then, uh, oh, sorry, you fit all this data at the same time, then you get an idea what, on constraints and bounds on how reorganization may have proceeded. So any, uh, this is something that any uh, theoretical model of uh, reorganization should, uh, should satisfy because we have this data and you can, cannot invent any, any possible um, uh, realization history uh, without fitting those data. Now, uh, what do we, uh, w something that we have learned, once you have this model, you can uh, then uh, do other things. So you can ask questions, you have fixed the model, so you have a fiducial model with some uh, possible, com with some confidence level uh, prediction, and so you can ask questions now to that model. So for example, uh, if you ask me now, uh, what, are the, what are the galaxies that mostly contributed to reionization? Okay? So you can ask the, the model the question, and uh, here is the answer. So uh, basically what we have here, this is the fraction of ionizing photons that uh, have been uh, pumped into the, into the IgM. Uh, produced by uh, galaxies residing in halos with mass larger than M, where M is, is written here, okay? So these curves uh, show at any different redshift ranging from six to 10, uh, and so this is six and this is 10. So this is the, uh, the fraction of uh, ionizing power that has been produced by a given uh, type of, of galaxies. And you see here that, for example, by redshift seven, which is close to the end of realization, you find that more than 80% of the ionizing power has come from, from galaxies uh, that reside in halos with masses less than 10 to the 9 solar masses. Now, these are very, uh, if, it, if that doesn't, doesn't tell you much, uh, I can tell you that, for example, for comparison, the halo of the Milky Way, our own galaxy, has a mass of 10 to the 12 solar masses, okay? So that means that the, the galaxies that have contributed most to realization are galaxies that are uh, very small. These are dwarf, tiny galaxies, so even smaller than the Magellanic Clouds, which are our satellites. So these are the, one of the, the key points. There are many other things that you can extract uh, from, from these models, but one uh, clear answer that comes out of that is that uh, if you want to do realization, you have to do it with uh, with a, with a large number of small objects that are very well diffused, that can efficiently reionize, reionize the gas. So the, another thing, and, and I will, uh, this is the last point I want to make on, on this reionization, is that uh, once you have your fiducial model, you can even try to uh, uh, explore and extract more information from the CMB on the degeneracy between reionization model and cosmological models. Uh, and again, so this is the, the figure I showed before. These are the data from the CMB for the three, uh, three uh, power spectra. So what you can do is just, okay, let's now, instead of keeping the cosmological uh, parameters fixed, like we know them and we only vary the astrophysical unknown parameters to fit the data. Now, once you have your fiducial model, which gives you the... Uh, the evolution of the neutral hydrogen, the, the electron fraction or neutral hydrogen fraction, which is the same. Uh, this is the fiducial, uh, the fiducial model that you have derived from, from the, um, anal the previous analysis. Then you can explore uh, variations around that and you can uh, span in principal components the actual, uh, the actual evolution of the electron fraction. Uh, in terms of, uh, of some eigenfunctions of the Fisher metrics that describe the relation of the, uh, polar the dependence of the polarization on the uh, electron fraction. So these are some eigenfunctions. And so you can compute the, uh, the uh, amplitude, the principal component amplitude. This is a little bit technical, but just to give you an idea that you can do an analysis that at the end of the day allows you also to explore the dependence of uh, the, uh, the, the link between the reionization and the cosmological parameters. So uh, from this analysis, uh, this is the, the uh, for example, this is the W map uh, values that you would get, for example, for omega B and the, uh, the, the primordial power spectrum index. 
uh, without with the step function reorganization. Okay, this is what is usually done uh, when uh, by by CMB people when they do their analysis. Now, if you look at the third uh, column here, where we also add the fiducial model for reorganization derived or, or fixed by uh, uh, satisfying all the astrophysical constraints, uh, the Gunn Peterson and the thermal history and blah blah blah, then you see that there is, there is some variation uh, which uh, may, may or may not be significant, but certainly uh, this is probably a more uh, complete analysis rather than taking a single step function. So uh, that means that, uh, that the realization is also uh, a cross-link with, with cosmology, so the cosmological parameters that we derive are also affected by the way uh, in which realization proceeded because the two things are, are definitely coupled. So now uh, it's time to, to go to the final part of, of, my, uh, of my lecture that uh, I have to do uh, with, the, with uh, the use of, uh, of 21 centimeter mapping uh, to study reionization and not only reionization. Of course, 21 centimeter is a, a, an entire new area of, of knowledge of the universe because it allows us to push uh, our observation, our experiments into a realm uh, of the of the of the very young universe where uh, there is no uh, other way to uh, to to study the processes that occur at that time. So essentially, within the the first uh, half billion year, or the first billion year of the of the of the universe. Okay, so uh, 21 centimeter, as as I'll show you, is. Uh, of course, we are coming from the perspective of cosmic reionization. It's very important uh, for the study of cosmic reionization, but uh, it's also important for uh, many other applications that uh, I'll try also to give some example of those. So, uh, why do we care about, why do we want to look, uh, why do we want to use uh, 21 centimeter to uh, study uh, reionization? Well, or in general, the high redshift universe. The thing is that, uh, as we have seen already, uh, the, the gun peterson opacity uh, increases very rapidly as you go uh, beyond redshift 6. Okay? So the universe essentially becomes uh, completely opaque to, uh, to UV radiation. And so this is a, is a bad, bad news because um, a lot of energy produced by galaxies and quasars uh, comes in that, in that uh, region. So, but the universe is becoming opaque. Uh, on the other hand, the CMB, uh, as we have just discussed, uh, through, the, uh, through, the, uh, through the electron scattering optical depth, provides only integrated measurements. So we have this electron scattering layer, and we can only have uh, measurement that depend on the integrated uh, depth of this, of this layer. So we are not sensitive to specific redshift. So if I want to ask what happened exactly at redshift 7.85, I can't answer that with the CMB. But as we will see, I can do that with the 21 centimeter experiments. So what is the 21 centimeter line? Uh, it's the line is the uh, is the uh, line that corresponds to a spin flip uh, transition of the neutral hydrogen. You know that uh, hydrogen is uh, a proton and has an electron, and the, there are two states uh, in that, that determine the hyperfine structure of the atom in which the two spin can either be uh, parallel or antiparallel. Okay, so and that uh, that is the coupling between electron and proton magnetic interactions. So um, this is a uh, this is a line that um, it's uh, it's very important and has been discovered back uh, the, uh, has been used in astrophysics uh, back by in the in the fix in the fifties when uh, Van der Hulst uh, a a Dutch astronomer had the first idea to, to use this line to study, uh, to study the uh, neutral hydrogen distribution in, in the universe. Uh, of course, that makes sense because, as we know, uh, hydrogen is the, by far the most uh, abundant element in the universe. So if you find something that can uh, powerfully trace the, uh, the most uh, important uh, component of the baryonic fluid, then you have a, a lot of advantage in, in understanding uh, the mass distribution in the universe. 
So as I said, uh, this is the, uh, the fundamental thing. So we have the, uh, the, uh, the line that is emitted when the, there is a spin flip between the, uh, of the electron, so from parallel to antiparallel. And so the, uh, the line that has been emitted as a, as a specific uh, frequency of uh, 1420 megahertz that corresponds to uh, uh, essentially 21 Point one zero six one centimeters. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the line that is emitted by neutral hydrogen atoms. Okay, the atom has to have an electron and a proton. So uh, ionized gas would not emit that. Okay, so uh, the the uh, again we have to deal a little bit if you want to understand the uh, intensity uh, and the transfer of of this uh, energy that is emitted. We have to uh, solve uh, the <coughs> radiative transfer equation, which physically is, is similar to the one for the uh, UV ionizing photon that we studied already. But in this case, we are dealing with the line. So this is line transfer, line radiation transfer. So the line has a specific uh, line profile, which is called phi of nu. So it depends, uh, the intensity of the line depends on frequency. And then we have the energy of the photon. And then we have two terms here. Uh, again, we have a source term. So clearly the line is powered by transitions from uh, the upper level, in which the two, uh, two spins are parallel, to the ground level, in which they are antiparallel. So I, from now on, I call it 1 and 0, respectively. So uh, the intensity is proportional to the number density of atoms that are sitting in the uh, excited level times the spontaneous, co uh, spontaneous uh, decay uh, coefficient. And then we have an absorption term, which is, uh, again, the number of, uh, uh, of uh, so we have the intensity field, and this can be absorbed by atoms that are sitting in the ground level that are excited to the, uh, to the uh, level one. Uh, and this is the uh, relative coefficient minus the uh, stimulated emission. So these are uh, uh, essentially it's a stimulated emission that uh, yeah, occurs when the um, uh, photons from the from of the radiation field interact with uh, an atom in the upper level and make it decay. So this is a stimulated emission. So A and B, of course, are the Einstein coefficient. So this is the, uh, the equation that gives us the uh, intensity of the line. And so uh, the as, as we have these two numbers there that are appearing, they are appearing in the radiative transfer, uh, so the, the number density of atoms in the excited level or uh, versus the number density of, of atoms in the ground state. So we have to... Uh, the degeneracy factor, so remember that the, uh, the upper level has a degeneracy, the degeneracy 3, uh, while the ground state has the degeneracy 1, so the ratio is 3. And then we have um, an exponential of uh, the contingency ratio of two temperatures. T star, which is the energy difference between the two levels. So the energy difference corresponding to the 21 centimeter line uh, corresponds to uh, a temperature of 68 millikelvin. So it's a very tiny, uh, it's very tiny uh, energy difference between the two levels that in, in terms of energy is roughly six uh, micro uh, electron volts. So it's a very tiny energy, but yet it's, uh, it's what uh, allows us to, to detect uh, this gas. And so, uh, and then we have another temperature which is fundamental for the 21 centimeter, which is the spin temperature. So the spin temperature, actually you can read this formula as a definition of the spin temperature. So the spin temperature expresses, in, in other words, the ratio between the excited and ground level of the hyperfine transition. Okay, so this is a, by, by, by all means, this is a definition of the spin temperature, which is, keep in mind that it's related to the uh, level population ratio of the, two, of the two levels. 
Now, usually, because this star is so small, it's only 68 uh, uh, millikelvin, in all, essentially all uh, astrophysical conditions, this star is much smaller than the, the spin temperature and T gamma, which T gamma, I, I indicate the CMB temperature at that redshift. Okay? So from now on, remember that T gamma is the CMB temperature that evolves like uh, T0, which is 2.73 Kelvin, times 1 plus Z. Okay? So because of that, because the T, uh, T is small, then uh, usually, uh, well, N1 is close to three times N0, so it's just the, the general C factor. That means that the uh, stimulated emission is in general important, because remember that in the previous uh, slide I was uh, showing you that this is the stimulated term, so uh, N1 is larger than, uh, is almost three times N0, and therefore, uh, Stimulated emission is something that we cannot neglect when we uh, try to uh, predict the uh, 21 centimeter intensity. Now, uh, in, uh, in this type of, uh, of studies, usually you define uh, another quantity which is uh, important and it's called the brightness temperature. And this is the way in which essentially you, uh, you measure the, the intensity of the light. So in, instead of referring to an intensity, we refer to something which is probably more uh, familiar to us. It's, it's, the, it's a temperature, and in particular, it's the brightest temperature. So what is the brightest temperature? The brightest temperature is the effective temperature at which you can put, at which you should put a black body radiator in order to have the intensity that you measure. Okay, so instead of, of uh, parameterizing the intensity of the radiation field by some number i, uh, you refer to a black, uh, essentially brightness temperature that is the temperature uh, which a black body would emit the same amount of radiation at that, <coughs> at that frequency. Now, uh, because we are working at radio frequency, remember 21 centimeter, it, it's a frequency that it's part of the, uh, the radio regime, uh, we are working on the, uh, on the Rayleigh genes uh, tail of the black body, uh, of the black body uh, function, the Planck function, and so we can work in this approximation that, uh, in which uh, Tb uh, can be written simply like that because you just uh, work in the Rayleigh genes regime where uh, you can neglect the exponential drop-off of the V and tail. So uh, this is the brightness temperature is simply related, is almost, uh, almost proportional apart from the, the, the frequency uh, to I nu, okay? And the radiative transfer equation that I, that I wrote before for, for I can now be written in terms of the brightness temperature. And uh, so you write the brightness temperature that, that uh, at the, in the rest frame of the source here. You're still working. The prime indicates that we are still in the, in the, um, in the rest frame of the source because there's also red shifting of radiation, of course. Uh, so the brightness temperature is written now by introducing the spin temperature that, that I introduced before. Uh, is written like the spin temperature times 1 minus e to the minus tau nu, where tau nu is, again, the optical depth of, of the line that I'll I'll come back in a second too, plus the, uh, the background radiation that you have uh, along, the, along, the, uh, along the line of sight. So uh, the, the, this background usually is the CMB, but because we are interested in cosmological application of the 21 centimeter, but uh, if you're doing, if you're using 20, 21 centimeter observation locally, you, it could be, you know, some radiation from gas behind your cloud or whatever. So in general, this is whatever it's coming from be, behind the emitting region in the 21 centimeter. Then uh, keep in mind that when we talk about the observed brightness temperature, you have, there is an extra factor one plus z uh, if you move from the cloud fr framework to the observed framework. Now, tau that enters in the uh, that enters in the in the um, in the previous <laughs> equation in the radiative transfer equation, it's simply uh, as we are used to is the is the integral along the line of sight of your absorption coefficient uh, per, per unit length, okay? So tau is a, a non-dimensional quantity, 
alpha nu as the units of one over length, so you multiply by a length is along the path, you integrate and you get your tau. The, the absorption coefficient is exactly what we saw in the, in the first slide. Okay? Remember that I told you there is a, a source and a sink. Okay? So this is the sink that enters in this equation, and uh, essentially this is the expression for the, um, for the absorption coefficient that depends on, again, on the population of the levels and so on and so forth. So now, uh, once you, uh, if you want to, uh, uh, to, to uh, well, it's very, it's very useful to make a parallel with the computation of the gamma peterson optical that, that, we, that we did. So the, it's exactly the same, uh, the same thing. In that case, we are considering the optical depth due to Lyman-alpha scattering. In this case, we are, we are looking at the 21 centimeter line, but uh, the physics is the same. So uh, I, the, it's a little bit, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of, uh, of math, but it's uh, relatively simple. You have to do the integration and substitute uh, for the uh, Einstein coefficients and, uh, and also choose a profile that usually is taken like uh, one of uh, the width of the line, so it's like a top hat uh, with a given width. So there are some, some uh, uh, you know, uh, technical technical uh, things here. But at the end of the day, uh, this is very easy, and you compute uh, tau uh, of, the, of the one zero transition. Uh, that depends on Einstein coefficient, the spin temperature, frequency, so these are all things that are more or less constant. And then we have, know that we have transformed the uh, number density of atoms into a uh, total number density, and this is a fraction of neutral hydrogen that you have at that time. Know that this is exactly what realization models predict. So realization model predict how the neutral hydrogen fraction evolves with redshift. And finally, because it's a line and you have a profile, uh, also the peculiar velocities along the line of sight may, may enter into the uh, computation of tau because uh, the line is a shape and therefore velocities, redshift or blue shift, the, the, uh, the absorption, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the redshift or blue shift, the photons that the, that the atom sees if the atom is moving along, along the line of sight. So uh, then you can recast, uh, there's nothing uh, other than uh, some uh, definitions here that, that you can find in, in test books probably. Uh, so you, you, you enter so <clears throat> the, the uh, Hubble constant that, that enters uh, in the, you can write it in terms of the, of the, um, of the Hubble constant because the density uh, can be written in terms of the critical density and so on and so forth. So there are some passages, but at the end of the day you find uh, a simple expression for tau that depends on the over density of the gas. Remember the delta is the uh, fluctuation amplitude with respect to the mean. Uh, it depends on redshift, so tau increases as you go to higher redshift as that reflects the fact that the universe becomes more and more dense as you go to higher redshift. Uh, neutral hydrogen fraction, spin temperature, and some cosmological uh, uh, factors. Now, actually, the final step before we can, uh, can make uh, actual prediction is the, as to uh, consider the fact that what we observe, it's the difference be between the emission from our neutral patch of the universe and the CMB. Okay? If this, so we, what we actually measure is the contrast between the, uh, that, that is the difference between the uh, brightness temperature of the emitting uh, neutral uh, patch and the background, uh, the temperature of the of the background radiation, which, as I said, in this case, is, is the CMB. Okay, so uh, so in order to to get that, we use uh, our uh, modified equation for the radiative transfer. Remember that this is the radiative transfer equation, and we use it. Uh, we use this thing in the in the small tau limit because we have seen that tau is very small. So uh, in this case, uh, in, the, in the small town limit, that equation uh, simply reduces to uh, a simple expression, which is the difference between the uh, spin temperature and the CMB temperature at the redshift times tau. And then 
there is one transit factor because this is the observed one. So given the expression that we had before for tau, so now that reduces to uh, a simple expression for the uh, brightness temperature of the, um, of the 21 centimeter line, which again, it's proportional to neutral, neutral hydrogen. So the first thing we note is that from a fully after ionization, if X H1 goes to zero, the signal goes to zero because there is no H1 to emit. Uh, the the uh, intensity will be uh, stronger from more dense regions of the universe where delta is larger, it will be stronger at high redshift. And there is this factor here which is very critical. Uh, now, what happens? Uh, if Ts, the spin temperature, is larger than the uh, CMB temperature, then uh, this factor will be positive and TB will be positive. So we see the signal in emission okay, against the CMB. So the cloud will be brighter than, than the background. However, if TS is less than, is smaller than, than, than the CMB temperature at that redshift, then the signal will appear in absorption because this term becomes negative. So we can have either a, a emission or absorption depending on the relation between the spin temperature and the CMB temperature. Note that uh, in emission, the signal uh, saturates because uh, at, at best this, this term can become equal to one. But if uh, in absorption, this factor can be arbitrarily large. So you can have, uh, while, while you can, you're saturated in terms of the uh, maximum amount of emission that you can see in the 21 centimeter, if you are looking at it in absorption, the signal could be as strong in principle could be infinitely uh, large, okay? So uh, this is an important thing. So that, that tell us immediately that absorption would be probably easier to be detected than emission, okay? So we have seen that in this. So uh, basically this formula is telling us that all the, 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 the actual physical, what happens is determined by this ratio. Okay? Apart from the amplitude, but this ratio is telling us if the signal is emission or in absorption and how, how, how uh, big is the signal. So TS is the, is the quantity that we need to compute. And so far we have said nothing about that. Uh, but so we, we need to uh, start to investigate uh, the, the, uh, how to determine uh, the spin temperature of the 21 centimeter. So the 21 centimeter, uh, remember, the spin temperature, remember, is the, essentially a way to express the ratio of the uh, population at the excited level with respect to the ground level. So there are three physical processes that govern uh, the, uh, the spin temperature. One is the uh, interaction of CMB photons. So CMB photons try to, uh, try to uh, force the atoms to be in thermal equilibrium with the radiation. So have the correct uh, distribution, relative distribution of uh, excited versus ground state electrons that uh, is relative to the temperature of the CMB. So that drives TS to T gamma. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the hydrogen atom also uh, have collisions with other, with other particles. Could be uh, other hydrogen atoms or electrons if there are free electrons. Uh, and so these uh, try to uh, scramble or mix up the, the level population. And therefore, by doing so, they drive uh, TS away from the uh, CMB temperature. And finally, they're also scattering uh, with UV photons, a very important process actually, that uh, again uh, mix this uh, hyperfine level structure and so they uh, move away uh, the population from the thermal equilibrium uh, population. And so this again drives TS away from T gamma. So how do you put the, all this, uh, how do you compute the, 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 the relative importance of these effects? What you have to do is uh, write down a detailed balance equation that uh, is uh, expressing the, uh, the population of two levels, N1 and N0, as a result of the combination of these various processes. So here, uh, for example, the uh, level, uh, electrons at level one uh, can go to level zero, make a transition, uh, a de-excitation due to collisions. 
or UV photons can also do some stimulated uh, uh, emission that drives uh, the electron to ground level. This is a spontaneous emission, and this is stimulated by, by the CMB. And the uh, inverse processes are also the ones that uh, produce a transition from the ground level to the upper level. So uh, this, essentially, if you solve this equation, that gives you the ratio between N1 and N0, and with the definition of Ts, you can get Ts. You get the spin temperature is determined by that. So this is essentially the way in which you compute uh, the temperature, the spin temperature. Now, uh, this, this, this equation, uh, uh, if you now introduce the, the temperatures, uh, the, the, the definitions of the uh, brightness temperature and, and, uh, and the spin temperature that we had before, so the previous equation in the Rayleigh genes regime can be written in terms of the temperatures. Remember that uh, we have, we have uh, that freedom that, uh, because we are working in the radio regime. So uh, the previous equation can be written in a more uh, sensible way like that, where now we have a number of temperatures that are appearing here. So this is the spin temperature. This is the CMB temperature. This is the kinetic temperature, which by definition is defined by the uh, ratio of the uh, excitation and de-excitation uh, coefficients by collisions, which is given by uh, the, the standard uh, <coughs> Boltzmann equilibrium. And so you define uh, the kinetic temperature in the usual terms. Then we have uh, uh, another temperature that refers to the, uh, to the UV radiation field now, if there is some UV radiation, and then we'll see how important is that. So that is defined, uh, that defines a color temperature in the same way. Formally is defined uh, as the ratio of the excitation coefficient and the excitation coefficient due to the UV uh, uh, irradiation of the atoms. And finally, you have this Xc and X alpha, which are the, the coupling, uh, coupling coefficients. Now, this color temperature, uh, it uh, essentially tells us about the properties of the radiation field around the Lyman alpha, uh, the Lyman alpha transition, which is the one, as we will see in a second, that is important. Now, most often, uh, we can neglect the, the, the fact that TC is slightly different than TK because there is a, an interplay between uh, uh, hydrogen atoms and Lyman alpha photons. There are recoils that, that tend to uh, equalize these two temperatures. So uh, this is a complication that we can forget for a second. And so most often TC, so this color temperature, it's, we can take it as equal to the kinetic temperature. So in this case, that equation can be written in a very simple way, uh, which tell us that uh, the, uh, the different, remember that this is the factor that is telling us if radiation comes, uh, this is this factor, right? So the factor that tells us if uh, the 21 centimeter appears in emission or in absorption and what is its amplitude. So it's a key uh, factor. So that key factor, it's, uh, proportional it's to a constant, which are these coupling coefficients, times the ratio between the gamma, uh, the CMB temperature, and the kinetic temperature. Now you notice immediately that, uh, for example, uh, in order to have this factor different from zero, then uh, this coefficient have to be uh, different from zero. So the, uh, collisional co the collisional coupling and the Lyman alpha or UV coupling have to be different from zero. Uh, also, you don't get anything also if the kinetic temperature is equal to the uh, CMB temperature, okay? So there are conditions uh, for which this factor is different from zero, because if it is zero, you see nothing, okay? So it's, uh, this factor has to be different from zero in order to see it either in emission or in absorption, and that depends on this combination. So uh, let's... Uh, concentrate for a second about the, these two coupling coefficients, so the uh, collisional coupling and the Lyman alpha coupling. The collisional coupling <coughs> as a you know, uh, simple expression that depends on, uh, on some uh, on the coefficient uh, from the, uh, the absorption coefficient uh, on the excitation from level one to zero and the ratio of T star the, the energy difference between the levels and the, and the uh, 
CMB temperature, and I collisions can be produced by hydrogen atoms or electrons. Now, uh, the interesting point about this uh, XC is that there is a critical overdensity delta for which uh, this uh, XC, this coupling coefficient, becomes equal 1 for HH collisions. And so this is the expression at which XC becomes uh, equal, equal to 1. Remember that I told you before that if XC, uh, suppose for a second that uh, we have no UV radiation, okay? So we are only left with XC, the collision excitation. So if the collision excitation becomes very small, then that number goes to zero and we see nothing. So the, this expression is telling us when, uh, under what condition, XC is becoming very small and therefore the signal disappears. Now, at redshift 70, or 1 plus Z equals 70, uh, we take the temperature of the gas that corresponds to the temperature of an adiabatic expansion, uh, adiabatically expanding gas at redshift 70, which is 88K. And so we find that at redshift smaller than 70, Xc becomes uh, less than 1 and, and very small, and therefore Ts goes to T gamma. Okay, the spin temperature becomes equal to uh, the CMB temperature, and by redshift 30, the IgM would become invisible. Okay, so if you have no radiation, no UV radiation in the universe, you would not see the signal at redshift larger, sorry, redshift below 30. Okay, and barely up to 70. So because collision are not able to scramble the uh, the level distribution very far from the CMB one. So uh, you see no contrast between the background and the, and the 21 centimeters. So in order to see the signal, basically, uh, practically, you need to have uh, some sort of UV radiation field, which must be created by whatever you, you, you want to uh, uh, whatever you want to think about, but so it could be stars, could be quasars, or it could be even dark matter, as we will see later. Now, so this UV radiation uh, produces a new uh, type of, of uh, coupling, which is, uh, is so important that it also deserves a name. Uh, it's called the 4,000 field effect from the name of uh, two uh, scientists, a Dutch one, 4,000, and uh, George Field, who was an uh, American uh, astrophysicist that realized that the scrambling of the hyperfine uh, levels, which are these two ones, so this is the one with the parallel spin, this is anti-parallel. So what you can do if you want to, uh, instead of playing only with these two, with these two hyperfine structure levels, what you can do if you have UV photons, uh, you can do the following. For example, you can take uh, an atom which is in the anti-parallel state, uh, it, you make it absorb a Lyman alpha photon that brings it up to level with n equal 2, and then from there you decay into the, into the excited uh, hyperfine state. Or you can also do other combinations, okay? So, uh, so these transitions that start from one level and uh, end up in another one can mix up the, uh, the, uh, the population of the hyperfine level away from the distribution that the CMB would, uh, is trying to impose. Okay? So uh, the, the, uh, the coupling coefficient then can be, uh, it's obviously, apart from constants, is proportional to this quantity PA, which is nothing else than the, uh, integra the, the uh, intensity of the UV flux integrated over, over the Lyman alpha uh, line, because you remember that this transition corresponds to the uh, Lyman alpha line uh, emission or absorption. <coughs> so we have a, a rate, this is a rate, and this is the, uh, essentially the coupling coefficient that you would get from the UV. So you need some UV uh, in order to do this job, and, but the intensity doesn't have to be uh, very large. So it's very, the, the intensity is relatively small. And this is obvious because also the, uh, the difference between the two levels is also very small. And so you don't need a very large intensity to do that, but you need some, some uh, UV photons, okay? Now, 
the last step uh, before we can do, uh, we can see what, what are the implications of that, is that uh, we need also to uh, to define uh, the power spectrum of the of the brightness temperature. So, the, or as you said, more in short, the power spectrum of the 21 centimeter. So what you do, <coughs> you define the, uh, the fractional perturbation to the brightness temperature, delta to 1 at the given position x in space, which is equal to the uh, difference between the brightness temperature at that position minus the, brightness, the mean of the brightness temperature over your volume divided the mean. So this is a zero mean field. And what you do is you perform the, uh, the Fourier transform of that quantity, you go in K space, uh, and so the 21 centimeter power spectrum is then defined as the uh, ensemble average over the, uh, of the uh, convolution of the, of, uh, of the Fourier transform of the fractional perturbation uh, to different Ks. Uh, and, and then you define P21 as that quantity uh, with the delta Dirac at K1 minus K2, okay? So this is a standard definition of, of a power spectrum. And you can also, what, what we use usually is the uh, delta, delta square K, which is P of K multiplied by K cubed, which give us uh, an idea of the variance of the field. So this quantity is proportional to the, to the variance of, of the fluctuation of the, of the uh, brightness temperature field. So uh, let's go to now with all this uh, theory. Now, uh, what, can we, uh, what can we learn? Good. So from, from these calculations, uh, we, the first thing that we can, that we can uh, obtain is the global history of the, uh, of, of the temperature. So how the different temperatures that enter in the 21 centimeter business uh, evolve with time. And uh, recall you that we have the three temperatures, the CMB temperature, the kinetic temperature, and the, uh, and the uh, spin temperature, okay? So the first line that you see here is the, uh, the, the dashed line is the uh, evolution of the CMB temperature. Nothing special about that. It's just an evolution uh, as one plus Z that we are drawing here. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the dotted line, which is the kinetic temperature of the gas. Uh, as, as, uh, as you know, the, the gas uh, is evolving adiabatically and therefore the temperature evolution of the gas uh, drops like, uh, after recombination, drops like one plus Z squared. Uh, so it, it drops faster than the, than, the, than the CMB. So the spin temperature has, uh, leaves in between these two curves. Why is that? Because at high redshift, the, uh, the collisions uh, the collisional coupling is sufficient to keep the spin temperature bound to the kinetic temperature, okay? Because the collisional coupling uh, of the collisions between hydrogen atoms uh, make sure that the uh, population levels is, is the one set by the kinetic temperature. But as I told you before, uh, around redshift 70, uh, the collisions, the the coupling of the XC factor, the collisional coupling, becomes inefficient and becomes very small and becomes so small that it also becomes zero. And you see that the spin temperature uh, by redshift 30 goes to, the, uh, goes to the CMB temperature. So from, as I was mentioning before, anticipating before, from uh, here down, you would not see anything. So you see an absorption feature here because you know that the spin temperature is below the, uh, the CMB temperature, but uh, here you see nothing. And so this is the fractional uh, delta, the variation of the brightness temperature, okay? So the brightness temperature that you would compute, you see here goes to zero. But here you have an absorption feature of the order of 40 milliK, which is uh, substantial. And that would occur around redshift 9100, okay? So uh, that is the, it, that would be what you would see if nothing has happened in the universe after recombination. So this is simply uh, the simplest case in which you're not considering. So reionization is not entering here. Now let's add reionization and see what happens. 
So now this graph is the same, uh, the same as before. So we have a temperature as a function of redshift. So this is the uh, this is the uh, CMB temperature, and the the thin line is the uh, is the kinetic temperature, and the thick line is the uh, spin temperature. But now, so you see that initially again as before, uh, T, T K and T S are coupled. Uh, and they are below the, the CMB temperature. But then if you now add reionization, look at this curve first, uh, you see that reionization produces a lot of heating. So they, uh, because they, he's heating the gas. Remember yesterday we were looking at the temperature distribution within ionized region that was 10 to the 4K. So it's much hotter than the CMB, which is here on the order of 70 or 80 uh, K. And so, uh, so the, the, what you see depends on the reionization model. So these are two different reionization models with different prescription, and this is the evolution uh, that has been assumed for uh, different courses. It's not important now to see the details, but clearly uh, reionization changes the, uh, the evolution with respect to the, to the previous case. You see that here the, uh, the spin temperature was uh, going close and uh, matching the the uh, CMB temperature, now uh, we don't see that anymore. There is a, there's a growth, so the after ionization, when ionization starts, the uh, 21 centimeters starts to become, to be, uh, to appear in emission rather than in absorption. And you can see that also from the uh, differential brightness temperature in millikelvin. You see, we still have this peak around no, uh, 50, 100, depending on, on, on details, uh, in absorption, and then we go uh, in emission here uh, of, of the order of 30, 30 millikelvin. This is the signal that you would expect from, from reionization. Okay? Now, uh, we can uh, implement all this in, in, uh, in numerical simulations. Uh, these are very large boxes, so much larger boxes than, that I showed you yesterday. So these are uh, rough, this is roughly one gigaparsec, so it's a light cone uh, of uh, one gigaparsec uh, size here. And uh, we're going from redshift 6 to redshift uh, 178 here, okay? So what am I showing here? is the uh, brightness differential brightness temperature in millikelvin. Now, the blue is where uh, the signal is in emission. Red and yellow is where uh, is in absorption. So this is a, essentially a 2D view of what we have seen before, but now it's coming from simulation rather than from uh, analytical models. But the physics obviously has to be the same. So at very high redshift, you see that the signal is, is in absorption. Uh, this is the, the, the depth, the, the very, uh, the, the dip that we saw in, in, uh, in the previous slide. So this one would correspond to something, uh, yes, to this deep here. So we, we are going along this, this uh, we are falling along this path in redshift, but now in 2D. So, uh, so there is a, the, in the first, in the first uh, part here, which are called the, the so-called dark ages, okay, because everything is dark, there's nothing else than CMB photons and this sea of neutral uh, hydrogen and helium gas. So the IGM is colder than the CMB, and, but the, the coupling, the collisional coupling becomes weaker and weaker, and it disappears. You see that goes to black here, where uh, the reason where uh, the, uh, the collisional coupling becomes very weak, and therefore the, the signal disappears. Uh, but then, uh, as the, the uh, first light appears, and we can now use uh, the UV uh, pumping, the Wouthausen field effect, then uh, again, uh, the IGM is still colder, colder than the CMB, but this Lyman alpha coupling, the Wouthausen field effect, or also uh, some X ray preheating, if you have, if you have X rays there could create a very strong absorption signal, okay? This is around redshift 20 or so, that uh, it's a very strong signature of, of the formation of the first stars or the first luminous sources that is reflected into this feature. And then eventually, 
as these uh, sources continue to pump uh, UV radiation uh, and energy into the IgM, the signal turns in emission and, and we are entering the, the, the real epoch of reionization in which the IgM is, is hotter than the CMB and there is also strong uh, spin temperature, kinetic temperature coupling due to the uh, Wuthausen field effect. So uh, at some point then the neutral hydrogen will disappear completely and the signal drops away. Okay? This is the, the brightness temperature evolution that explains, uh, the, explains the, uh, the global evolution of the 21 centimeter. Uh, we can also look at the, at the power spectrum. I have a, a small animation from, from the same simulation. Now you can compute, and I'll show you an animation of that. Uh, you can compute the, the power spectrum that, that we have defined before as a function of uh, the uh, of the uh, wave number in inverse megaparsec. So as if you, here you have the redshift, uh, we have the mean, uh, mean neutral hydrogen fraction, one means it's all neutral, and this is the value of the uh, delta Tb, the brightness temperature that, that we see. So let, let's see if I can run, um, uh, if I can run, an animation that I have for that. Okay, I can't see it. I see it on my screen, but I can see it there. Don't know what to do. Um, sorry, I, I can see it from here, but <laughs> doesn't have that much. I don't know why it's not showing up on the screen, but uh, okay, forget about that. Uh, we will we'll live without that. Yeah, so anyway, it was showing how the, uh, this line here was uh, going, uh, going up and down and changing shape uh, from the, uh, as the as realization as, through time, right? From redshift 120 to redshift 6. So it's the same uh, simulation that we have seen before in terms of the uh, global signal. In this case, it's just the, the power spectrum that is, that is changing. And so by measuring this power spectrum, we can uh, really learn a lot about the, uh, the topology and the evolution of cosmic, of cosmic realization. Now, uh, together, uh, we, we have not said much about the possible eating processes that are occurring as the first sources appear, and that would make the signal, uh, make a transition from absorption to emission, okay? So what are these eating sources? The eating sources uh, can be uh, of different nature. Uh, very important is the uh, X-ray heating from astrophysical sources, as we have seen uh, also yesterday. Uh, all galaxies emit uh, all uh, to any star formation rate in galaxies. There is an associated uh, X-ray emission, and X-ray emissions are important because they they warm up the 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 IGM uh, on very large scales because the X-ray have a very long mean free path, so they can eat up the IGM very, in a uniform manner. Uh, so X-rays are certainly important. Uh, Lyman alpha heating uh, is, uh, is also uh, of some importance, not as important as the X-rays. So that means that uh, when you, when you uh, uh, essentially there is a recoil uh, effect uh, associated with the absorption of, of Lyman alpha photons that, that is then transferred into kinetic energy of the atoms. So it's a small effect, but it's, it's there. We can have shock heating uh, by, for example, if you have supernova explosion that, that, or also structure formation shocks that could eat the gas. But also uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting possibility, and this is the, the last example I'd like to do uh, before we, uh, as, a, as a final uh, applications of the 21 centimeter connected to the organization, but also connected to other uh, important uh, 
or important problems like dark matter uh, in, in cosmological context. Uh, so uh, another application of 21 centimeter would be uh, to study the heating produced by uh, the annihilation or decay uh, by dark matter particles, which is certainly uh, very uh, exciting, at least to me, perspective uh, in the use of high to 21 centimeters. So, what is the so let me concentrate on that in the last uh, 10 minutes or so and let me show you what we can do what we can learn on dark matter by using the 21 centimeter observation that we will do anyway for realization okay so what happens is that once you have a, uh, uh, a an episode of uh, uh, annihilation of two dark matter particles then uh, there is a, uh, the, the injector particle, whatever it is, we can have, uh, have, we can have several channels of uh, annihilation and decay. So, but in general terms, you have some uh, high energy injected particle, which typically is, uh, starts with uh, 100 GeV or, or 1 TeV, depending on the mass of your favorite candidate dark matter uh, particle, that creates uh, a cascade in which the uh, energy is eventually uh, thermal so um, you can have uh, all sorts of particles, or leptons or photons, uh, and, and eventually uh, you can have processes like photoelectric absorption, Compton scattering. Um, all, all, I mean, this is a very complicated cascade, but we can model nevertheless. Uh, that eventually produce, can have three uh, final uh, outcomes. Uh, one is the uh, thermalization of, of, of part of the energy is thermalized and goes into uh, eating of the gas. Some of the energy is lost to uh, ionize the, uh, the gas and in particular hydrogen and also some other, uh, some other uh, uh, energy goes into uh, Lyman photons, which are also useful for us uh, in terms of uh, exciting the 21 centimeter line through the Vautuism field effect. So uh, it, this seems a, a very nice situation for uh, the, it's a perfect situation, I would say, uh, for, uh, for the 21 centimeter because, as I just said, we have Lyman photons to excite, the, to, to, to make the uh, Lyman, the Botulism field of effect. Uh, we have uh, eating that, uh, again, uh, makes a clear signature of the presence of um, energy input from, from something else, which is not uh, the, the, uh, the global evolution of the IGM. And finally, you have also a little bit of ionization. So fortunately, uh, ionization by this uh, high energy particle is not very efficient. So it leaves most of, it's a little bit like X-ray. So it, it leaves, is not, it does not produce a full ionization of the IGM. Uh, that would be bad because otherwise the 21 centimeter line would not be observed, but they produce a little bit of ionization that, uh, that is also uh, produces electrons and, and collision or coupling. So uh, can we uh, model that in a little bit more detail? Yes, uh, so oh, if we want to understand what are the effects of dark matter decays onto, onto this, we can uh, write down the two uh, equations, the ionization equations and the energy equation that is telling us how the gas is ionized as a result of uh, the dark matter uh, annihilation decay. So we are studying a case in which there are no stars yet. Okay? So we are working at very high redshift. Uh, so we are working in the, in the condition in which there is nothing else than adiabatic expansion and dark matter energy injection. So the simplest situation possible, which is the one in which actually we are interested in, because this is the a clear signature of the effects of dark matter, because there is only dark matter other than the adiabatic expansion of the gas. So uh, this is the ionization equation, so how the, uh, uh, ion the electron fraction uh, evolves as a function of redshift which is produced by the ionization rate due to dark matter de uh, annihilation decays and the standard uh, recombination. So this is exactly the same as the uh, re uh, ionization equation that we wrote yesterday, with the only exception that now gamma is produced by dark matter rather than stars. And here again, this is the evolution of the kinetic temperature that enters into the 21 centimeter business. And again, uh, 
there are several terms, but the important, the important terms here is this uh, uh, energy deposition, which could come from uh, Compton heating if you have astrophysical X-ray sources, or in this case, dark matter annihilation. So you, this equation gives you, gives you how the uh, ionization fraction and the temperature evolve as a function of, as a function of redshift. <coughs> So the eating rate that was the last term that, 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 that I show you, uh, in case of dark matter, uh, can be essentially written as the uh, as, uh, is proportional to the to the annihilation cross section of the dark matter over the mass of the particle, and then there are cosmological factors here: the critical the critical density uh, and a boost factor that uh, has to do with the fact that the annihilation not only come from the dark matter at the mean density, but as we know, there are inhomogeneities and non-linear structure, and where the density is higher, therefore the, also the uh, annihilation rate uh, goes up because it depends on the square of the density. And so this boost uh, factor must be estimated from, from for example, by uh, fits to uh, numerical simulation that follow in detail the uh, growth of structure, and, and therefore you can estimate or get simple forms for the uh, for this structure formation boost. And so, so you have a, a fit that that uh, describes the average dark matter density enhancement from collapsed structure. And these three parameters, there are BH, uh, ZH, and, and delta here, must be determined from numerical simulations. But they depend a little bit on the, what is the uh, cut of the dark matter power spectrum that you are assuming. For example, if you cut your uh, dark matter power spectrum at, uh, at uh, different masses, like 10 to the minus 3 of the solar mass or 10 to the minus 9 of the solar mass, these parameters change. So uh, there is a dependence on, on the spectrum of the, of the primordial spectrum of the, of, the, of the dark matter. And so what is the minimum scale on which a dark matter particle can cluster? Okay? So this is the, that number. And depending on that, you have some dependence on this B factor and therefore in the eating rate. Now, uh, to make a, a specific example, um, showing you uh, what we can do, for example, with an uh, interesting uh, dark matter candidate, which is a light WIMP with a, with a mass of 10 GeV that uh, annihilates into uh, two muons, a pair of muons, with an annihilation cross-section, uh, which is given by this number. So why do we choose that? Well, uh, among these different candidates, is in, uh, the, the uh, light uh, wind particle has been uh, advocated to explain, for example, uh, the signals that we have from the galactic center, the, this galactic haze synchrotron emission, uh, or also uh, low energy signal from, from direct detections like uh, uh, DAMA or CREST, even though you know, that is, we don't know exactly what, what, the, what the particle mass is, but this is a, a particle that is interesting because it's more or less consistent with all the uh, constraints that we have so far. But of course, you can, you can play around with any uh, favorite dark matter candidate you may have. So uh, the, the constraints that, that you can get uh, from, from this particle by uh, by fitting the, uh, by, by looking at the, at the, for example, the power spectrum of the CMB, uh, so you can constrain the mass of the, of the, of the, uh, the cross section versus the mass of the particle for three different channels, uh, of the, for different annihilation channels in tau, in mu, or in electrons. And uh, you can find uh, constraints that are allowed by the, uh, by uh, these experiments on, on the mass of these particles. So depending on, on what uh, type of channel you are assuming, you can have uh, different constraints. So what, what is the uh, result for the 21 centimeter then? Well, uh, 21 centimeter in this case, uh, considering just as I said before, the channel in which annihilation uh, occurs in the, in the muonic channel, uh, so this is the brightness temperature that we have seen many times. So that the black line would be the uh, the the case in which uh, there is no dark matter decays. But if you allow for dark matter decays, which are the purple, red, and yellow curves, uh, then. Uh, 
th that correspond to different cuts in the, in, the spectrum, in the power spectrum that I mentioned before, so 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 6, or 10 to the minus 3 of uh, solar uh, masses in, in the clustering uh, mass scale. So you see that uh, there are strong deviations from, from, uh, from this peak, right? From this peak that occurs at Redshift 20, which is the absorption peak uh, corresponding to, uh, to, to the, the cosmic dawn, just before the cosmic dawn at the end of the dark ages. So if you measure this peak, uh, and this is something that uh, we should know because it's simply due to the adiabatic uh, expansion of the, of the universe, which we think we understand precisely. So any deviation that you can measure from this black curve would be signaling the presence of uh, dark matter annihilation. And so depending also on uh, how big the deviation is, you may also be able to say uh, something not only on the particle, but also on the power spectrum of the, of the, of the dark matter as well. So you see that, uh, for example, if you have uh, dark matter, the clusters of very tiny scales, uh, one billion of, of the solar mass, then you, the, the heating rate is so large that you can also turn from uh, uh, absorption to an emission signal even before, well before the formation of the star. So uh, this is uh, very uh, intriguing. And also what you can do is just to uh, look at the, uh, the analogous power spectrum at the fixed scale. So you fix the scale, the power spectrum, which in this case is uh, uh, 0.1 inverse megaparsec. And you look at the uh, evolution of the of the power spectrum on that scale as a function of redshift. So uh, the plot is very busy, so let me uh, drive you through it very uh, uh, slowly. So the black line here is the, uh, the standard model, so the one without uh, dark matter effects, okay? And so the solid line uh, turns into in a dashed line when uh, the signal goes from absorption to emission, okay? So uh, before I go into the other details, uh, let me show you that there are uh, experimental uh, detection uh, limits here, that these are instruments like LOFAR and WA that are already available right now. There is an upper limit by another instrument by paper here. But uh, in the near future, we will have available two other instruments that are called two interferometers, uh, HERA and uh, SKA that will will be able uh, to take these measurements in a in a less in a few hundred uh, hours actually we 1000 hours you would get down here so it would be a perfect representation of all the spectra so anyway the black curve is the uh, no dark matter fiducial standard case and then we have this, the, the three cases that I mentioned so 10 to the minus 3 10 to the minus 6 10 to the min minus 9 uh, cut so the first thing you see that, for example, in 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 6, this peak that corresponds to the cosmic dome, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's depressed, okay? So it's, uh, it's depressed because the, the gas is becoming uh, uh, heated up by the dark matter, so the power spectrum is decreased. Uh, and also, if you, if you go to the extreme case of 10 to the minus 9, you given, uh, as, a, as we were discussing before, you go to a null point here where the uh, signal turns from uh, being absorption to being emission at very high redshift. Okay? So by looking at all, this, all these uh, features here, we can be uh, able to uh, measure the presence and the nature of uh, dark matter annihilations uh, in, in the very high redshift universe before the, <clears throat> the formation of the star. So it's a very clean uh, measurement that we should be able to do. Uh, well, SKA is supposed to be online in 2020. So in 2020, we should be able, if not, anything else worked before to set very uh, strong constraints on, on dark matter and, the, and the, also on the mass of the particle. So I just conclude with the, uh, with the summary of this, uh, of the effects of the dark matter because uh, I went a little bit uh, fast perhaps. So the effects of the dark matter is that they depress the, the, the peak, uh, the second peak of the power spectrum uh, and Interestingly, the second peak, of course, where the signal is already in emission. So this is a very clear uh, prediction. Uh, this feature cannot be produced by, uh, by any astrophysical source. Uh, and in particular, if 
dark matter dominates the heating uh, considerably, then uh, the brightest temperature uh, goes to zero before any X-ray source appears. So uh, a null detection of the uh, power spectrum at very high redshift would indicate that there is dark matter and this is preheating the gas by annihilations. And that in turn would lead us to strong constraints on the mass of the particle. And it's a different way, or it's an indirect uh, way to study the uh, dark matter in the, in the universe. And I think I'll stop here. <laughs>